Father in heaven, we thank you for keeping us all safe through the week, for your many blessings to us, as undeserving as we are. You are so gentle, so loving, so kind to each one of us. Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray that that word that created the universe, that word that is powerful to create and has the power to transform, will touch each of us. We pray, Lord, that you will guide us, that you will speak directly to each one of us, and that your word will be mighty powerful in our lives. Guide us now. Give us your spirit, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been in a situation where, when you have felt under pressure, literally or figuratively? Yes, raise your hands. Okay, I want to talk to whoever did not raise their hands later. I, I believe all of us can relate to a time when we have felt under pressure. It could have been when you have to turn a project in school or at work. It could be if um, maybe you've gone through a financial difficulty or just dealing with family member or relatives or, I mean, there are plenty of opportunities to be under pressure, don't you think? Yeah. Mental pressure is very real and we all have experienced some level of it. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. I do remember when the Lord came through to my mind in the year 2000 and revealed to me that there were things, serious things, that I, need, that I had done that I needed to confess and make right. It was, to me, a time of severe mental pressure. But as we have gone through t periods of pressure, stress, I am, I think I'm right when I say that we have also been able to experience the deliverance that comes from being subjected to that pressure when the pressure is released, when the pressure is lifted. Because we all know that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we do that, pressure is lifted up. Can you say amen? Sin puts severe pressure on our being. Many times, truly, it is sin what brings the pressure. We think is a financial difficulty. We think it is a relative or a friend. It's their fault. If they wouldn't be around me, everything will be better. Right? Uh, most of the time, we bring this upon ourselves. It is our own condition. Now, mind you, not all the time. We have examples like Job, right? He was actually praying for his family, praying for his children. And out of nowhere, lots and lots of stress came to his life. And when those things come, when we are really not at fault, when we are really not looking for trouble or problems or stress, and he comes, we still have a job to do in surrendering. Can you say amen? And allowing God to take care of it. Today I would like to focus our attention to, on, on him who endured the most severe pressure a human being has ever endured. Turn your Bibles with me to chapter 26 in the book of Matthew. Brother Reed read a few of those passages and a few of those verses. 
But from the onset here, I want to tell you that no human being on earth has ever gone through much more pressure than Jesus. So if you've ever felt pressure, if you, ever, if you feel right now that you're in a situation where there is no way out, you feel like there's darkness all around you, I want to turn your eyes on Jesus. I want you to look at him and what he went through and you will begin to recognize that maybe many of the things we're going through are truly insignificant in comparison. And yes, we are going to go to all four Gospels and we're going to read all those passages and then I'm going to read a section of the Tsar of Ages uh, to bring complete perspective on, on this experience that Jesus went through. So I believe you are already in Matthew chapter 26. Brother Reed read from verses 36 through 39. Let's begin there in verse 36. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and finding, findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand at the, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's go to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 14. Beginning in verse 32. Very similar account. There it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye, sit ye here while I, sh while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye be here, and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, 
but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinner, sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Beginning in verse 39. This is Luke's account. It says in verse 39, And he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And, he, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be... If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest, pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw What would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut his ear, his off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Let's go now to John chapter 18. Beginning there in just three verses there, John John eighteen. Beginning in verse one. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. We'll just stop there. This is the account that... um, just focuses on what happened later. I apologize, I want to sneeze. I don't want to sneeze, but but I want to sneeze. Do you know what the name Gethsemane mean? It means an oil press. There were lots of olive trees there. It was located, it is still today, located at the foot of the Mount of Olives. I went to on uh, Google Earth and also to some websites looking for some pictures. Now I'm good, thank you. Um, and uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of buildings there. I was hoping that I would see just a garden, a beautiful garden. You can from all the buildings that are there, all the structures, the the very, very busy roads and things like that. Uh, you can't even tell the Mount of Olives. Uh, but it is, uh, it is where the garden was. 
there's still a little garden people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction has been among the foremost in church activities. He will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible. Its measure was the guilt of, its, of his nation, of his accusers and betrayer, the guilt of a world lying in wickedness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the scenes of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. Behold him, contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul, in his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn farther from God. The chilling dew of night falls upon his prostrate form, but he heeds it not. From his pale lips comes the bitter cry, O oh, my Father, if it, would, if, it would, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet even now he adds, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The human heart longs for sympathy in suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those whom he had so often blessed and comforted and shielded in sorrow and distress. The one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony. And he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt. While he stood innocent before God. If he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened. The disciples awakened at the voice of Jesus, but they hardly knew him. His face was so changed by anguish. Addressing Peter, Jesus said, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. The weakness of his disciples awakened the sympathy of Jesus. He feared that they would not be able to endure the test which would come upon them in his betrayal and death. He did not reprove them, but said, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Even in his great agony, he was seeking to excuse their weakness. The spirit truly is ready, he said, but the flesh is weak. Again, the Son of God was seized with superhuman agony. And fainting and exhausted, he staggered back to the place of his former struggle. His suffering was ever greater than before. As the agony of soul came upon him, his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The cypress and palm trees were the silent witnesses of his anguish. From their leafy branches dropped heavy dew upon his stricken form, as if nature wept over its author, wrestling alone with the powers of darkness. I'll just stop there. Quite a vivid image of what Jesus went through. What was Gethsemane like for Jesus? Gethsemane is where the pressure of sin was crushing the life of our Lord. You know, we go about our daily activities, our trials, and as we go through those activities, trials, deadlines, our conversations, how do we normally view Jesus? On a day-to-day -day basis, how do we think about him? 
How often do we stop to meditate on this part of his life? I wonder if in our selfish human nature we tend to just want all the good he offers to us without entering into his sufferings. Speaking of his sufferings, turn with me to Psalms 22. Psalms verse 22. I'm sorry, Psalms 22 and verse 1. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. And I'm trying to get a measure of how sorrowful he was. And there are some passages here that explain that, or at least present to us a little bit of that. Verse 1 in Psalms 22 says, what does it say, friends? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 12, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a, as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell my bones they look and stare upon me. And then if you go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. There in verse 19. In verse 20, it says this, Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness, and I look for some to take, what? Pity, but there were how many? None. And comforters, but I found none. And I wish that as we read these verses, we can go in a little bit into his experience of sorrow. He said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. That, those words mean, exceeding sorrowful mean being sad or to be in distress. In Ephesians chapter 4, there's another word that translates this Greek word for sorrowful, exceeding sorrowful. Ephesians chapter 4, Here's somebody else that can feel the same kind of sorrow Jesus was feeling. Verse 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30 says, And, what's the next word? Grieve. Same word. Exceeding sorrowful. Grieve not who, friends? The Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's the same word. Jesus was in grief. And I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit will feel the same things when we choose to disobey. When we choose to reject the call of God in our hearts, He feels exceeding sorrowful. Mark 14.33 says something else. When we read that passage, Mark 14, 33, if we go back there, there it says, 
that he took Peter and James and John with him, and he began to be sore amazed. And if you look at verse in the same, oh, actually in, in chapter 16 of the same book, chapter 16 and verse 6, the same word translated sore amazed in 1433 here, it says, and he saith unto them, be not what? Affrighted. What does that mean? Afraid. Don't be afraid. This is Jesus. After his resurrection, he appears to his disciples and he tells them, don't be what? Afraid. If you go back to chapter 14 and verse 33, he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. And I, um, oh, I'm sorry, verse 33, it says, the description there, it says, he began to be sore amazed. What does that mean? He was afraid. Jesus was afraid of what was coming. He was sore amazed. He was afraid. He was in agony. In Luke 22, 44, we read the description that he was in such fear, such agony, such sadness, so grieved was he that he began to sweat blood. We have never felt this kind of pressure. None of us has. Whatever you may be going through today, friends, you need to know that Jesus went through much, much more. And he did so so that you can endure so that you can be restored, so that you can be saved. Can you say that? amen, friends? All of this that he's going through in, this, in these descriptions, he did it for you. And you can tell from the descriptions that he, not, he did not want to go through this. So what should Gethsemane mean to us? I have several thoughts here about what it should mean to me and to us. First of all, Gethsemane represents a place of decision, a place where uncompromising decisions are made. If you go back in the book of John, chapter 18, we read just a few verses there. But in that same chapter, we can see that still being in Gethsemane, after making his decision to su surrender to the will of God, Jesus said this in verse 11. This is after Peter had pulled out his sword and attacked the servant of the high priest. He says there, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. And then notice what he said. The cup which my father hath given me, shall not I drink it. Jesus had made a decision to obey the father. In another passage we read that he told God his father, all things are possible for you. If he had to go through this, friends, what does it tell you about the possibility of Jesus not going through it? What does it tell you about sin itself? The Son of God had to die in order to save humanity. There was no other way, because there is no compromise with sin, friends. None whatsoever. And if Jesus was able to make that decision under those circumstances, knowing what was coming to him, knowing that he was becoming sin, who knew no sin, and he stood firm and made that commitment, shouldn't we, friends? Shouldn't we do it? 
2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 2. And he says there, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, what does it say there? Now is the accepted time. Now, behold, now is what? The day of salvation. Today is our day to make a decision. What is it that Jesus has been calling you to give up? What is it that Jesus has been trying to do in, our, in your life? Today is a day of decision, friends. Can you say amen? 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And verse 21. Elijah standing in Mount Carmel. Talking to God's people who have gone astray. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, there says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, what does it say? Follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Brothers and sisters, if God has been speaking to your heart's truth, if the Lord has been speaking clearly to your hearts what the truth is in your life, the truth of the Word of God, why halt ye between two opinions? If the truth is clear from the Word of God, follow it, friends. Follow that truth. Don't stay halting between two opinions. Today, to me, Gethsemane is a place of decision. And now it goes deeper than that, because personally, in my own experience with the Lord, there are things that God has called me to give up. God has told me. He has shown from His Word things that I must give up. I must give up. And he speaks directly to me that I must make a decision and follow what is true. If you are a young person, where are you in your decisions and following the Lord? Is God speaking to you? Another thing that comes up as we go through these passages in Gethsemane is that Gethsemane represents a place where sleep and I'll qualify that as idleness indifference lack of spiritual strength sleep is dangerous as it will lead us to forget our master turn in first Peter Chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse 8. <clears throat> there it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the who? Devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, mind you, friends, this is not about being aware, being in connection with God, so that nothing bad happens to us. Physically, emotionally, bad things may happen to us, friends. But this alertness, this watching that Jesus called us to, this vigilance that we are called to in First Peter is about 
this connection that we have with Jesus Christ. As we study, as we pray, as we do His will, those things, even if pressure comes, we will be able to stand, friends. Can you say amen? We will be able to stand. When He calls us to watch, He's calling us also to be keenly aware of what He feels. Did you catch when he came back to his disciples and he found them asleep? And he asked them the question, Are you sleeping? Are you asleep? And we read in the Star of Ages that as a human being, he's looking for what? For sympathy. Have you ever gone through a struggle and... What's the first thing you want to do when you're struggling? You want to tell somebody. You want somebody to relate, somebody that could give you a helping hand if they can, but if not, at least that they would pray for you. And when Jesus went there and he found them asleep, it was very disappointing. And what strikes me is that what he is calling us to do when he's calling us to watch is to realize Better yet, to be keenly aware of how he feels. When we're going through the struggle, it's all about how I'm feeling, right? Because it's uncomfortable. We don't want it. We want to, for that problem to go away. And as we are going through that, what Jesus is calling us to do is to Put your focus on something else. Put your focus on Him. I've heard of studies that have shown that uh, people are happier when they do volunteering work. Have you heard of those studies? People are more fulfilled when they volunteer, when they do work for somebody else. Jesus is calling us, as He's calling us to watch, He's calling us to put our attention away from our own condition, our own problem. He'll take care of that. That doesn't mean He doesn't care about it. But as we try to help somebody else, as we try to serve somebody else, our own problems will become a lot smaller. We can make them bigger just by pondering and just kind of rehearsing them in our minds. But ultimately, he's calling us to be keenly aware of how how he feels. How does he feel right now? Have you ever thought about that? How does Jesus feel right now? We know he is in heaven. We know that he is working uh, in the work of intercession on our behalf. But have you ever thought about how he feels right now? As he sees the human condition right now, the suffering in the world, how does he feel? How does he feel when I reject a time in the morning to spend with him? How does he feel when I just go through my reading in the morning as a checklist just so that I feel better, that I actually get it done? How does he feel when we don't spend time with him? How does he feel when you confuse the evening prayer with the meal prayer. There's a disconnect there. I've done that, friends. I'm saying that because I've done it. How does it feel when you are praying and you fall asleep in your prayer? I'm just revealing some of the things that have happened to me. How does he feel? Have you ever thought about that? Watch, he says. Watch. Watch is not just about alertness, about, oh, you have to be careful here, right? And watching all around you and being careful. No. Watch means, do you know how I feel? Take your eyes off of yourself, especially at the moment of pressure. Gethsemane teaches us that our Savior Jesus Christ has deep human feelings. He wanted sympathy. 
someone to care for him. And how do we care for him today? How can we? Remember Matthew 25 and verse 40, The king shall answer and say unto him, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto who? Unto me. That's how we care for Jesus. He went to pray. We talked about this. And he came to them twice to get some comfort from them. Can you imagine Jesus going through this, desiring not to go through this anguish, through this process, through this grinding of becoming sin for us. And those that he's doing this for are not even interested. They're asleep. Can you imagine how Jesus felt when he went back? He's praying, Lord, if this cup cannot pass from me, thy will be done. And he goes to those that he's doing this for, and they're asleep. And they almost like could care less. And that's where the strong temptations from the devil came. And beyond looking at what happened to him on the cross, the physical anguish, this was true anguish in his heart. This was, you know, when we see somebody that doesn't want to listen to us, it's very too easy for us sometimes in our human nature to write them off very quickly sometimes. Jesus did not do that. We read that actually he felt pity for them. He felt that if they are asleep, how can they go through the rest of this? When I die, what is going to happen to them? They're not ready. Even then, he was thinking they're not ready. And he told them, pray, watch, and pray. The Spirit can do it, but all alone in the flesh, you're not going to make it. They were not even supporting him in prayer. Matthew 26, 37, it says that he was sorrowful, extremely sorrowful. He was sad in distress. He was grieved, and he is, he, you know, he feels sad. He is in pain right now as he sees the suffering of humanity. He is grieved when we choose our own way. When knowing what is right, when knowing the plain teaching of Scripture, we choose to follow our own inclinations. We tend to live, follow the path of least resistance, the path that is going to cause us less problems, or so we think. We are so focused on ourselves that we just don't have time to stop to ponder at the suffering of God. The church is in such a state of sleepiness, selfishness, that all that she wants is for God to do what she wants. But if there's something else that Gethsemane reveals, is that he feels our pain. Can you say amen? Hebrews 4.15. If you go to Hebrews 4.15. He feels our pain. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, Yet without what? Sin. He feels what, he feel, what we feel. He was afraid. He felt fear. He was in agony to the point that he was physically affected. He, his sweat became blood. You see, Jesus became a man that he would overcome as a man. That he would gain the victory where man failed. And that he would pay for the sins of men. But he also became a man that he could understand, that we, I'm sorry, that he could understand what you feel, but that we would understand how he feels. Did you catch that? 
He became a man so that we can understand that he feels pain, that he suffers, that he feels sad, that he cares. The pity that he feels, we can feel as well. God has feelings. Life is not just about us. It's about us focusing on what God wants. It's this image of God that we have of an exacting taskmaster. No, he cares for you. He loves you. And he wants you to feel how he feels. He wants you to understand that he knows how you feel, but he wants you to understand how he feels too. In Gethsemane, we are reminded that there is no excuse for sin. If there was a way to excuse sin, if there was a way to do away with God's commandments, Jesus would not have to die. That cup would have passed from him. There was no way. That's why he asked God, his Father, all things are possible for you. He tells us that it was impossible. Because there is no excuse for sin. Jesus had to go through this. But we also learn that in Gethsemane, pressure can yield transformation. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2. Through verse 4 it says... My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. When was the last time you counted it for joy? When you were going through a problem. Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. This is one of my favorite passages. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. There it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Doing what, friends? Watch, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. What did he do? For the joy that was set before him, future, not the joy he was going through in Gethsemane, the future joy of seeing his creation restored For that joy he endured the cross. He despised the shame that that brought. And now he's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then verse 3 says, For consider him, Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You see how it continues to pull our thoughts away from ourselves? And to him, to Jesus, consider him, that went through all this, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Because if we don't do that, if we focus internally on what what is happening to me, and I focus on putting the blame of somebody else of what's happening to me, this is what will happen. You will be wearied and faint in your minds. And then it concludes by saying this. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. That is perspective. Anything and everything we're going through today, we should be thankful for. Can you say amen? That was a tough amen. (laughs) Can you say amen? amen? Everything that we're going through today, we should be thankful for. Amen. It's not fun. It's not comfortable. But have you ever resisted unto blood, striving against sin? 
Jesus did. He's just giving us perspective of who truly has gone through suffering. And the suffering we're going through, Jesus will give us victory over. Can you say amen? Jesus will help us. But that's only if we place our eyes on Him. If we focus on Him, focus on service, focus on ministry, focus on His Word, focus on obedience to His Word, focus on prayer, prayer not only for myself, but for others. When we do that, He will save us. Can you say amen? He will relieve the pressure. He will give us victory. The problem may not go away immediately. But we will put our eyes where they should be. And He will take care of the rest. By the way, if you've gone through a situation recently, or if you're going through right now, can you tell of any other situations you've gone through that you have passed and you can look at on the sunshine side of that problem now? Yeah? You made it, right? You made it. Oh, this one is different, though. This one is different. Well, it's not much different. It's not worse than what Jesus went through. Can you say amen? So you, with him, will go through that one too. Whatever it is, friends. Whatever it is. You know, um, Julie, can I put you on the spot for a second? Just go like that. It's not going to be bad. But we have used an experience that Julie has gone through recently, and she continues to go through, as a, as a realization that is, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It is something that we would rather not have to go through. But at the same time, I believe that that situation is drawing our daughter closer to her Savior. She needs Him. She needs her Savior. And so this situation, even though we didn't ask for it, it came right out of the sky, pretty much. And it's uncomfortable, and we have to go through it pretty much every week. It's helpful for her, because it will place her eyes on her Savior. Can you say amen? And we need those things. Now, we could also use that same situation. She could use that situation and just whine about it or just give up completely and just run away from that situation. She can. She could do that. She could run away from that situation and not have the problem anymore. But this situation is helping us, all of us, bring, bring us closer to each other pray for each other, and to bring us closer to God. We might as well stay in it. Plus, she needs that. She needs the, the reason why she's attending this particular place where there's a situation unfolding pretty much every week is for her own good. So running away will do away with some of the things she needs for, for life. Gethsemane... Um, Teaches. There's other verses if you want to write them down. Running out of time here. First Peter one three through seven and five verse ten. First Peter one three through seven. And then First Peter five verse ten. Just read those this afternoon when we talk about yielding transformation. But then Gethsemane teaches us that the fight the fight against sin is real. The fight against sin is real. But we have a promise, and you're in Hebrews there. Go to Jude. Very close. Jude, verse 24. He went through Gethsemane, friends, so that he would be able to keep you from falling. Can you say amen? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you 
faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Gethsemane teaches us that the fight against sin is real, but you can go through that fight with Jesus. Can you say amen? The fight against sin is real. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Second Peter 1 verse 10 will be our last passage that we go to, potentially. First, Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. There it says, but chiefly them that, I got, let me make sure that I'm, oh, chapter 1, Second Peter 1, verse 10. It says there, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never, what? Can you look with joy to that time? Amen. You will never fall. I want to get to that point. And we will, by God's grace. He will keep us from falling. But our eyes need to be on Jesus. We need to watch. We need to pray. There's a, a passage in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. I'm going to read it from the contemporary English version. Romans 13, 11 through 14 Especially I like that version because uh, the way it reads on verse 14. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says, You know that, I'm sorry, you know what sort of times we live in. Do you? These are pretty interesting times for sure. And so you should live properly. It is time to wake up. You know that the day when we will be saved is nearer now than when we first put our faith in the Lord. Night is almost over. The day will soon appear. We must stop behaving as people do in the dark and be ready to live in the light. So behave properly as people do in the day. Don't go to wild parties or get drunk or be vulgar and, or indecent. Don't quarrel or be jealous. Let the Lord Jesus Christ be as near to you as the clothes you wear. Then you won't try to satisfy your, dis your selfish desires. Amen. A month ago, there was a 7.5 earthquake in Indonesia. The island of Palu was the most affected one. After that earthquake, a tsunami came and continued the destruction. There was in that island an airplane that was about to take off when the earthquake hit. And on that tower, there was an air traffic controller, a 21-year-old Antonius, an air traffic controller. While the earthquake was happening, while his tower was about to crumble, he stayed there until the aircraft took off. And then he left the tower. By that time, it was pretty late to get out, and he found himself having to jump four stories to his death. Just a month ago this happened. But it reveals to us humanity. He did not leave his post until the wheels of that airplane were off the ground. Then he took care of himself and didn't make it. But while the earthquake was happening, his focus was on keeping safe the people in that aircraft. He was considered a hero and he was given a, a hero's uh, burial. 
I told you I was going to not put you to read another verse, but let's do this. Let's go to this last verse, 1 John 3.16. Do you know John 3.16, right? Well, 1 John 3.16 is very similar. I don't... I think this is... Uh, this is uh, divine. But 1 John 3.16 says... Hereby perceive we the love of God because, what did he do? He laid down his life for us. And it doesn't stop there. It says there, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, when we take our focus from ourself our condition, our problems, and we focus on Jesus and we watch and pray and we take care of our brothers and sisters, that's when salvation comes to our lives. That's when we can be healed ourselves. When we focus on what he did when he went through this oil press that he went through, Pressing the precious oil. You recognize that Jesus went through that. And after his death and resurrection, humanity was able to receive the Holy Spirit in full measure. After that. As we think about this man that gave his life for a few, it just points our eyes to the one that gave his life for all. The one that gave his life for you and me. Can you say amen? As we focus on him, I have to ask the question, are you willing to surrender your life to Jesus today? Are you willing to follow through with his will, even if it means temporary suffering or discomfort? Are you willing to enter into his sufferings and walk humbly with your God? Are you willing? If you are, would you stand with me to close? Now, before we sing our song, what's our song? By the way, our song, can somebody give me the number? 157. Our choristers, have you ever sing that song before? Okay, you have. It is an easy song to follow, but I made an appeal. I haven't called you to come to the front. But I am. Now, I don't, I'm not asking for everybody to feel obligated to come to the front. But if you are willing to go into the sufferings of your Savior, if you're willing to give yourself up, as we are singing this song, I would invite you to come to the front so that you can tell God clearly that this is what you want. Don't stay in your chair. Come forward as we sing.
If you have your hymnal, I just want you to focus on the last three lines, the very bottom of the page. The call there says, learn of Jesus Christ to pray. Learn of of Christ to bear the cross. Learn of Jesus Christ to die. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are thankful for what you went through. And as we studied what you have gone through, Father, we pray that you will help us to get a sense of what you have gone through. Get a sense of your sufferings. Get a sense of your love for humanity. Help us to take our eyes off of us and to watch and pray. Help us to carry our cross, carry our burdens. We confess that they are uncomfortable to bear. But we know that you will bear and bear them with us. You will help us to carry them. And we pray that we will count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of our faith worketh patience. Father, it is because of that patience, it is because of that victory that we crave, that we are here, standing before you, making this decision to follow you. You don't promise that it's going to be easy, but you promise that all of this is going to be worth it. So as we make this decision today, we pray that you will help us to remain faithful. That you will help us to remain faithful to the truth that you had revealed to us. And that you will give us an active life of prayer and service to others. So that we don't become weary and faint in our hearts when we just look at our own condition. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.